the moment we've all been waiting for. What is a virus? So you've seen this slide before when we talked about hard to kill microbes. Um, so I wanna, I'm gonna review a little bit of the anatomy of a virus. So on the left here, we have a bacteriophage. This is the typical way bacteriophages look. Remember, bacteria, phage means virus. A bacteriophage is a virus that attacks bacteria. Okay, so I, I see that a lot of you are still really confusing bacteria and viruses. Bacteria are ginormous compared to a virus. A virus is just a couple small molecules. A cell, a bacterial cell, is huge. It's got, you know, every single phospholipid in that phospholipid bilayer is not going to be that much smaller than the virus itself. So Bacteria are just ginormous compared to viruses. Viruses are not alive, they're just a couple molecules, and you know what the cell is made out of, right? I mean, if you don't, you need to review, again, like prereqs with chemistry and all that, like phospholipid bilayer, just that by itself is massive numbers of molecules, right? And that's just the phospholipid bilayer. That's not even counting all the proteins floating around inside of the cell. This is, this virus is not much bigger than just a single protein, right? So they're tiny. All right, so here's the bacteriophage, and, in, and this is an example of a non-enveloped virus. There are human viruses that are non-enveloped as well, but I'm, this is just one example of a non-enveloped virus. A non-enveloped virus does not have a lipid envelope. So what you have is you have genetic material inside, which, you know, in viruses, you have some viruses that carry DNA as genetic material, and on other viruses, you have RNA as genetic material. So in this particular bacteriophage, we have DNA is the genetic material. So there's the viral genome. It's very, very tiny. It's just got a few hundred genes, maybe a couple thousand, but not many. Um, and then you have the capsid. So the capsid is made out of protein. So we call it a capsid. Um, so this, and, and this is not to be confused with the bacterial capsule. Capsules are made out of glycocalyx, which is sticky sugar. This is protein. So again, you know, you, you, before you took this class, you should know the difference between carbohydrates and proteins, nucleic acids, lipids. If those differences between those molecules and their chemistries is confusing for you, that's something you really need to review or you're really going to struggle here because we're talking about the very small world this is where that the differences between those molecules really matter, right? So, um, so here you have your DNA or RNA, the genetic material, then you have the protein capsid that's protecting it. And that's all that you need to have a virus. Seriously, that's like, that's pretty much it. Or, well, pretty much it. So you need, you need actually there's three components. Th there's three basic components, the genetic material, the protective protein case, and then uh, spikes or attachment proteins attachment proteins. The attachment proteins are to help the virus attach to the cell. So here, that's the fibers. So in this bacteriophage, you have the fibers. So these attach to the cell that it's going to infect. And for a bacteriophage, it infects bacterial cells. The virus is acellular. You can see there's no cell here, right? It's just genetic material in a tiny protein case and then some protein fibers to help it connect and infect the next cell. That's what you get with a non-enveloped virus. And, and, and non-enveloped viruses can be all different shapes. This is the typical shape for a bacteriophage. A human viruses may look different. You know, there's many, many different kinds of viruses. They have many, many different kinds of shapes, but those are the essential pieces. They're all gonna have genetic material. That's their blueprints for building the proteins, right? And then they have a protein case that protects the DNA. And then they have protein fibers or spikes that help them attach to the cell they're going to infect. They have to be able to attach to the cell before they can infect the cell, okay? So those are the three basic components. Now, on the right here, we have an enveloped virus. Enveloped viruses are surrounded by a lipid envelope. The lipid envelope is the phospholipid bilayer that it stole from the cell that it budded out from. So viruses infect cells, make more viruses inside the cells, and then they leave the cell that they infected, and then they go infect a new cell. So what an enveloped virus does, so, so non-enveloped viruses just split the cell open when they're ready to escape. They just, they, they have these enzymes that just destroy the cell, and then they escape. The Enveloped viruses are a little gentler. So what they do is they do this thing called budding. And we'll talk about that later in this lecture. They bud, which means that they, 
they bloop out. <laughs> so you have the, the genetic material, in this case it's RNA, you have the protein capsid still, but the protein capsid is embedded in this phospholipid bilayer, but the way the virus got that is from, it was made, this virus was made inside the cell, and then it blooped out, it took some of the plasma membrane with it. It's sort of like exocytosis in reverse, right? So it's, um, it's the, the phospholipid bilayer uh, made this bubble around it and left with the virus. Now there's also, it still has attachment proteins, but the attachment proteins that it uses to attach to and infect the next cell, it's not on the, it, those proteins are not on the capsid. They're embedded in this phospholipid bilayer. This is not considered a cell. I know because it has a phospholipid bilayer, you might be tempted to think it's a cell. It's not. The phospholipid bilayer came from the host cell that it birthed out of, you know, quote unquote birth. Uh, it, the virus doesn't make the phospholipid bilayer itself. It takes it, it steals it from the host cell that it's leaving from. And there's nothing in it except this protein case. It's, you know, it, it's not alive. It doesn't have, it still doesn't have all the life-like qualities of a cell, okay? This is just shrink-wrapped around the, the protein capsid, which is this white hexagon here. Now, these protein spikes, uh, they're, are they labeled? They're not labeled here. So these protein, these purple things outside, those are the spikes. And that's, those protein spikes are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, and it's what the cell uses to attach to the next cell to infect. So remember, hard-to-kill microbes, non-enveloped viruses are harder to kill because, or quote-unquote kill, they're harder to inactivate because these protein fibers used to attach to the next cell, they're embedded in the protein case. Proteins are much, or proteins are much more durable than lipids. So here the protein spikes are in this phospholipid bilayer. If the phospholipid bilayer dissolves, like you dissolve it with bleach or something, those protein spikes are going to be gone. Now you might still have intact the RNA inside the capsid, but there's no spikes there that can be used to attach to the next cell, so it's inactivated. If, if these spikes are lost, the, cell, the virus can't infect the next cell, okay? So you still have the basic components, the genetic material, the protein capsid, and the protein spikes or fibers used to attach the next cell. You don't have the protein spikes or fibers, there's no way for the virus to invade the next cell, okay? All right, what is a virus? Is it alive or not alive? Well, it's not alive. Um, and let's talk about why. We've covered this briefly. Let's review this a bit in a little more detail. Well, remember cell theory. All living things are made of cells. All cells come from pre-existing cells, and the cell is the most basic unit of life. Um, the reason for the cell as the cutoff for life, the reason that we have the cutoff for life at cellular, cellular level, is that you need to have a membrane you need to have a cell membrane to maintain an internal envi environment that is conducive to life, that is homeostatic, that's different from the external environment. You need to have a membrane to carry equipment for life-giving functions, such as reproduction or metabolism. In other words, the cell membrane provides self-sufficiency. And it seems like, you know, that viruses that are enveloped viruses, they do have this membrane, but like I said, it's shrink-wrapped, basically, around the capsid. There's no room in there to carry anything. There's nothing like there's no there's no enzymes there's no met metabolic equipment there's no reproductive equipment there's nothing there's the DNA inside a protective protein case with a lipid envelope shrink wrapped around it it's still not considered a cell because it doesn't have all these other things okay so um, a cell membrane provides self-sufficiency because it allows the organism to carry all the equipment it needs to stay alive and to replicate so a virus is not alive according to cell theory, but they do have behaviors and complex processes that are encoded in their very own genetic material. So a virus has a genetic code for the capsid proteins. It also has a genetic code that allows it to produce viral enzymes once it's inside the cell. It doesn't have, you know, to produce protein, you need to be able to read DNA, transcribe it into RNA, translate it into protein. If you're not a cell, you don't have the equipment to express the DNA as protein. But virus, viral DNA does have codes for proteins in enzymes that are not, that it doesn't bring 
physically to the cell. It brings the genetic code, but it doesn't bring the proteins. So once the virus is inside the cell, it's the viral genetic material hijacks the cell. So, so now the cell starts transcribing and translating viral proteins instead of host proteins. And those viral proteins might include enzymes that can destroy the host, that can uh, make the host sick, that can uh, do things that the virus needs the cell to do for it. Okay, So the virus brings genetic material. And that genetic material codes for more viruses. It codes for viral enzymes that the virus didn't come with, but that can be now built inside the cell. And, and then the virus uses the cell, you know, the virus uses the ATP that the cell was producing. The virus uses the nucleic acids to make more RNA and DNA for the virus. Those nucleic acids were part of the cell's environment. The virus uses the amino acids that were already in the cell to build proteins. So all the building blocks for everything the virus needs to use, all the energy that the virus needs to use, it takes from the cell. And then, it, and then when it's using ATP from the cell, it, you know, virus can't make its own ATP, but when it's using ATP from the cell, it's using the metabolic equipment from the cell, it's using the building materials from the cell, then it can sort of seem like it's alive. So some scientists say, you know, this is a gray area. It's a matter of philosophical debate. I mean, who, it's just a matter of definitions, right? But some scientists would say that a virus is alive while it's inside the cell, because when it's inside the cell, it's metabolizing, not using its own equipment, but using the cell's metabolic equipment, it's metabolizing. It's using ATP. Um, it's also building, you know, it's replicating. It's doing lifelike things, but only while it's in the cell, because the virus doesn't have the equipment to be lifelike, but it can hijack the cell's equipment so that it seems lifelike. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is when a virus is inside a cell, it has no form. So when a virus is floating around outside the cell, you know, in the environment or even in the bloodstream, it's got DNA inside the capsid, it's got a physical body that we can actually see with an electron microscope. When it enters a cell, the protein capsid falls apart, the genetic material is released, and you can't see it anymore. But that's when it's metabolizing. That's when it's replicating. So it's only lifelike when it has no body, when its body is a shambles in these separate pieces that can't be detected. So that's a very interesting thing, I think, about viruses, is that the lifelike functions are separate from the physical form. So when all the pieces are put together into a body, it's an inanimate object. When they all fall apart, that's when they start hijacking the cell and behaving in a lifelike way. Right, so different viruses have different host ranges. Um, and what I mean by that is um, how many species can the virus infect? Can it infect um, only one species, a bunch of closely related species, any species? You know, is it a generalist? Is it specialized? So how many, and then there's also the question of tissue types because some viruses can only infect one kind of cell you know, when it comes to the human body. So for example, HIV only infects, um, HIV only infects white blood cells. And chicken pox and herpes, well, chicken pox especially only infects um, nervous tissue. Herpes infects nervous tissue. So different, there are some viruses that are not just species specific, but are actually tissue specific. Or maybe the virus can infect one tissue type, but across several different species. So that's what I mean by host range. You know, what species is it infecting? How many species is it infecting? What tissues does it infect? Now, how many different types of tissue or host species a virus infects depends upon um, the proteins it uses to bind to the host. So we will get to that in a little, it, we'll get that to that later in this lecture. But a virus has, we talked about those protein fibers, we talked about those protein spikes that it uses to bind to the host. The protein spikes and fibers on the virus have to match up with some protein on the cell. So wherever the virus finds its match, that's a cell it can infect. So if the protein, the, if the protein that matches with the protein spikes, if the host cell protein that can bind with the protein spikes on the virus, if you only find them in one tissue type, then the virus can only infect one tissue type. If you can only find it in one species, then the virus can only infect one species, right? So that's, if you find it multiple species, then the virus can infect multiple species. So that all has to do with 
uh, viral proteins binding with host cell proteins. So if you think about the coronavirus, which is relevant to this day and age, so you may have heard that coronavirus came from a bat. They're actually not sure. The reason they say that is because um, other, the other SARS um, and also MERS, which is a closely related virus, those came from bats. We don't know for sure that COVID-19, that SARS-2 came from bats, but that's, that's why people say that. But there might have been an, an intermediary species. But the point is, you know, there is this, what it binds to is uh, ACE2, which is a protein uh, that's part of the blood pressure regulation pathway. So, uh, and, and you find it in the lungs, um, but you find it in other parts of the body as well. So the virus binds to that protein, ACE2. Now, every mammal ha and, and reptile actually has ACE2, but the proteins are slightly different. You know, there have been mutations over time. The protein is slightly different in different species. And so initially, SARS-2 or COVID-19 COVID could only bind with ACE2 on bats or whatever species came before us. And then it mutated in such a way that it could now infect a new species, okay? So that, that mutation in the spike proteins that the virus uses to attach to host cells that it was a mutation there that changed host specificity. Right, let's talk about genetic material in viruses. Now, viruses are very strange. So you know that all living things use DNA as the genetic blueprint. RNA is just the middleman. Trans, you know, RNA just takes the, the genetic message from DNA to the ribosome for protein translation, right? Um, but viruses have some weird things, you know, they're not fully alive, they've got, they're very simple and they use, they have, there's other stuff going on. So some viruses use DNA for their genetic blueprint, but some use RNA for their genetic blueprint. COVID-19, that's an RNA virus, so is influenza. So some viruses carry RNA as their genetic material. Um, now also in viruses, you can have double-stranded DNA, which is what we're used to, or you can have single-stranded DNA. You can have single-stranded RNA, which is what we're used to, or you can have double-stranded RNA, where it kind of looks a little more like DNA with a double helix shape. So you, pretty much anything goes here. It's still nucleic acids for genetic material, but you know whether it's DNA or RNA, single, double-stranded, you get all kinds of wonky things in viruses. Um, now, the genetic material, like I've said, it encodes, it's, it's the, the blueprint for building the virus's own protein capsid, which is the protective case around the genetic material. Um, sometimes that genetic material uh, can, well, actually, all, almost always, it will encode for a few enzymes that help the virus infect a cell, procreate, and even exit the cell. So if the virus is going to burst out of the cell, it's going to need some enzymes to break the cell open, right? Well, the host cell isn't going to have those enzymes. It's going to have to be the blueprint for those enzymes that burst open the host cell. The blueprint comes with the virus. It's in the viral genome. But then the host cell makes the proteins that are going to burst itself open, right? So, so, the viral, so that's what's in the viral genome. The viral genome codes for... It's the blueprint. Sorry, my computer is dinging all the time, so I have lots of emails from you know the online <laughs> this online scenario that we have now. So the um, the genetic blueprint in the viruses they're the, they're the blueprint for the protein capsid, um, for the enzymes to help the virus replicate, for the enzymes uh, that help it infect, for the enzymes that help it procreate. Okay, um, so that means the spike proteins that are that it uses to attach to the next cell. The code for that is in the viral genome. Enzymes to burst the cell open, encoded in the viral genome, That's so on and so forth. Now, the viral genome is very small. Uh, it's only, you know, viral genome, different viruses have different sized genomes. They can be anywhere between 3,000 and 250,000 nucle nucleotides large. So 3,000 to 250,000 quote unquote letters. Um, and for a basis for comparison, E. coli has, it's, the, the genome for E. coli is 4 million nucleotides long, 4 million. So this is much, much, viral genomes are very tiny compared to bacterial genomes. All right, capsid. The capsid is the protein coat. It is, its function is to protect the genetic material. It can take on many different shapes and it might be enveloped inside a lipid envelope or it might be exposed or non-enveloped. Right? The envelope. 
mostly lipids, um, right? It's, it's because it's their phospholipids. Remember the vi viruses that have a lipid envelope, they don't make it themselves. They take it from the plasma membrane as they're exiting the host cell and then they use it to enter the next host cell. Okay. Um, but it also has some proteins and carbohydrates embedded in it. Often those protein and carbohydrates are part, they, the proteins are encoded in the viral genome. Okay. Um, so that, that's the spikes that I'm talking about. So there's sometimes spikes. The spikes help uh, the virus adhere to surfaces and also to the next cell. Um, so, but the lipid part especially is taken from the host cell during exodus. So let's look at a picture of this. Here's influenza. Influenza is an RNA virus with a lipid envelope. COVID-19 is also an RNA virus with a lipid envelope. So this blue ball is the influenza virus. You can't see its capsid because it's inside this phospholipid bilayer that it took from the cell after it exited. Um, and then these little things out here, these are spikes. And it, the virus is going to, these spikes are going to attach to the next host cell so the virus can infect the next host cell. These red things are antibodies. So this virus is covered in antibodies, which are little weapons that your immune cells make and spit out at the virus. 